Today we are going to talk about electric submersible pumps or also known as ESPs. Electric submersible pumps. So we're going to, my, my intention is to give you uh, a short introduction about uh, ESP, how they look like, how do they work, what do we use them for, uh, the, the basic performance of an uh, electric submersible pump, which is very similar to a regular uh, pump, centrifugal pump, and then we're going to make an exercise. So you should understand after this section uh, how, how the pump looks like, what are the components of the pump, what is the performance of um, the performance map of the pump, and then also to know how to do some calculations uh, with, with an electric submersible pump. So to start, we are going to make the, the plot of a, of a well. We're going to draw a well. And the electric submersible pump is typically installed as part of the tubing. It's typically threaded to the tubing. Let's make it like that. Okay. You have well head. And let's say like what we have been saying before is that you are very close to a separator. So let's took now, take now like what we have done previously, the equilibrium point. So let's say that this is the PWF, that's the suction of the pump. And then you have the P at the discharge of the pump. Inside the tubing, P at the discharge of the pump. So if we plot the available pressure at the suction of the pump, versus the rate, okay, here is, if it's a pump, it's usually using, um, it's usually using liquid, or it may have oil with some gas, but it's mainly, mainly liquid. And then you have the pressure, and then the first pressure we're going to plot is the PWF, which we have seen before, it has, in this case, might be the IPR, okay, that we're making it, actually, we should make it a straight line, because, we're going to talk a bit, okay, a bit about it now, but okay. But let's say that our our reservoir it's a undersaturated oil reservoir, and that it has that behavior, okay, the IPR. And that essentially is the IPR. Of course, if the pump is not exactly located in front of the perforations, then you this appears all the time. It's not exactly located in front of the perforations. Let's make the formation also. Then you have this curve will include also the flow in the casing when it's reaching the intake of the pump. So that's the available pressure, this pressure I will call it PWF available, and then we have the pressure at the discharge, which it will be something like that. Pressure at the discharge of the pump. Then if we had no pump, of course the pump occupies some space, so maybe the curves will be slightly different. But if we had no pump, this will be the equilibrium point. Q oil equilibrium with no pump, no ESP. However, if we have a pump, the main intention of the, of the pump is if I want to produce a rate which is higher than the equilibrium rate. Okay, let's say I want to produce this Q, QO star. And in that case, the energy I have available is less than the energy that I require. 
the energy that I have from the IPR, the pressure that I have, is lower than the pressure that I need to overcome all of these losses against separator pressure. Okay, so this is the bridge, like in the same case as a choke or the same case as, as a compressor. This is what I have to bridge delta P of the that the pump has to has to bridge, has to overcome. <clears throat> and similar to similar to to the choke or to the compressor, we have essentially so if we have our delta P okay, of, of Q versus delta P across the pump, across the ESP. Okay. We, in time, what will happen is that this IPR, for example, it will start to, because reservoir pressure goes down, will start to reduce and reduce. And therefore, the delta P of the ESP will always, uh, will, will increase, could increase. Okay. So similar to, to the compressor, we have a series of points. Let's say that we are keeping the same rate, but increasing the delta P. So you have... Let's say that it goes like that. We are going to see later how it looks like, but essentially with depletion. With depletion, again, be careful here where plotting is uh, the um, standard condition rate versus the delta P across the ESP. And we can say here we lost, um, mm -hmm. okay, and we're saying with depletion, delta P across the pump is increasing. Okay. <clears throat> so there is a limit in, in which, like uh, on the contrary of the choke, for example, the choke we saw, there is always one way to make the delta P of the choke to give me what I need with the combination of rate and delta P. However, for the compressor, we said that with the operation has, uh, the compressor has an operational a performance map and we have to be within that map. And there were also some additional constraints related to uh, the temperature, related to power, related to um, uh, was essentially uh, and, and suction pressure. Okay, so we the 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 pump also has a compressor. The 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 pump also has operational constraints. One of them is it has a limited available power or what we call maximum maximum power. Or power capacity. Next, uh, we have also a uh, oh, performance operational envelope, operational map or operational envelope. And then there is one more, uh, it, it's a bit simpler than, than the compressor because it's a liquid. Most of the energy gets transformed directly in pressure, is not transformed in, in heat, like when you compress a, a gas. So the, the temperature is not a big issue, it's usually not a big problem. But you have an operational map, just like in the compressor. If you remember, you have um, the polytropic head, AHP. 
and you had the Q at this suction, and this was actually the Q actual, the Q of gas at the suction, and you had a few series of curves that they looked a bit like that. That was for compressor. We had something like that, where this was the rotational speed max, the rotational speed mean, and then you had at this side you had the uh, the choke line, and then on the other side you had the surge line. So in our case, in the pump, we will see we have a similar envelope, and also we had that the P at the suction has to be usually greater and than the bubble point pressure at that particular temperature, which is usually the reservoir temperature. The bubble point pressure. Why? Because we have no liquid, no gas, no gas is allowed in the pump. Of course, there are some pumps that are a bit more tolerant to gas. We are going to see some, some figures uh, later. But essentially, you don't want the pump is made to handle liquids, mostly liquids. So if, if there is any amount of gas in the pump, it will cause to, to some problems in its operation. So that's why we have the constraint that the P suction of the pump has to be greater, usually equal than the bubble point pressure. You might also have, you don't have that constraint. But then you have to produce the gas if you have, for example, the pump, and you have You have production through the annulus, and then you will have a liquid level. Then you have the gas bubbles going through that liquid, which it can be considered as stagnated. And you have the separation. In the ESP itself, you have a separator that separates the gas from the liquid, and the gas is produced through the annulus, and the liquid is produced through the tubing. That configuration we might have in some fields, in the onshore fields, but usually we don't have it onshore or offshore. Offshore, we typically have another packer, so that's offshore, uh, onshore, sorry. And offshore, we have typically the pump, and we have a bottom packer that simply isolates the annulus. Okay. Therefore, in that case, all fluids, if it's gas or liquid, they have to go through the pump. And in that case, it is important to keep the pressure above the bubble point pressure, or at least keep the amount of gas that is out of solution low, such that the pump can be able to operate. Okay. Uh, some typical gas tolerance in the pump is around GBF 10%. GBN, GBF stands for gas volume fraction. And it's at local conditions, with local rates, the GBF will be the Q of the gas divided by Q of the liquid, plus Q of the gas, gas volume fraction. And this Q of the liquid will be the Q of the oil plus the Q of the water. Local rate, local volumetric rate of oil and local volumetric, volumetric rate of, of water. And of course, here we need to multiply by 100 because that gives me a fraction to one. I want it in percentage, so I have to multiply by 100. So it's a bit difficult to relate it with the GOR because uh, 
This is local conditions and the GOR is in standard conditions measured, measured in the facilities, but essentially it's a, a low amount of gas to, for the pump to operate properly. There are some pumps that they have extended GBF, but then the geometry has to be very different. And the delta P, the pressure increase that these pumps can achieve, they are usually lower. So these, these three, keep these, these three in mind. It's the power capacity, is the operational map, and then is the, the P at the suction. We don't want to have any gas. Onshore, we can simply vent that gas through the annulus. We can produce it through the annulus such that it doesn't accumulate. But offshore, if we allow it, if we separate, it will essentially accumulate until it reaches the suction of the pump, and then it will go through the pump anyhow. So the pump typically has three parts. So first, a bit of uh, history. I think you have to be familiar with uh, the inventor of this pump was a Russian engineer called Arme Armais Arutunov. I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's uh, this guy here. A Russian immigrant and moved to the US and came up with this several trial and error to try to put the most challenging part was to put a motor because the motor for the pump is located also downhole. So the main challenge was to look to place a, a motor inside the well and that the motor will be able to survive uh, for for in, for the operation. <coughs> So the pump, if we make another schematic, another well, so we have, usually has three parts, every, all of them next to another. So the pump, the first part is screwed into the tubing at the bottom of the tubing. Then you have another part, and then finally you have the motor. So the different parts, this is the pump part, this is the protector or the seal, and this is the motor. So the electric motor, it receives power from, so you have, remember we have the hanger, the tubing hanger. In this tubing hanger we have <coughs> usually the power cable of the ESP coming inside. We are going to see a picture just now how it looks like then it goes on the tubing and it goes clamped to the tubing okay let's make first the, the casing it goes clamped how do I make the clamp okay it goes clamped that cable goes clamped to the tubing and then goes all the way to the to the motor And the pump usually has an intake. Uh, you have the, the protector and seal, and this is avoiding that the fluids that you're pumping, they go and they enter into the motor. The motor has its own hydraulic fluid, and it it's, uh, doesn't, it's not compatible with the production fluid. So it should be a closed environment. So in that case, you have uh, some seals that are because you have an axis coming out. If we make it maybe in a dotted line, we have an axis that goes from the motor that is rotating and goes all the way connected to the connected through the pump. Okay, so that's like an axis that goes on the inside. So that's rotating and has a series of seals that avoid fluid to go along the axis to enter from the pump to the motor. These are the mirrors finish the drawing these are some clamps and the pump might have uh, might have a gas separator okay, which if you have gas and you're separating at the inlet then you will see that the gas goes out through here okay. 
But in cases, like I told you, if you don't have access through the annulus, you cannot produce through the annulus, then you have to force everything to go through the pump. But in many applications, you have this gas separator to separate the gas coming from the formation and then send it through the annulus. And these are, these are some clamps. Okay, so let me now show you some uh, figures, how it looks like. So that's the wellhead. a lot of space here This, uh, this page <clears throat> so that's um, the tubing hanger that's exactly this part that I'm showing here to the left you have the tubing hanger you have the the no-go shoulder you have the seals and here you have the penetrator from which the power cable that is not always not only power but has some uh, also might have some sensors pressure sensor of the pump vibration goes together on that cable and that's the tubing which is threaded to the in this case to the hanger to the tubing hanger so the pump on the inside Sorry for that. So so the pump, if you see, maybe we look at the components first. So we see here we have uh, an impeller, that's the rotating part. And you see it has that impeller is, um, that impeller, if you open that impeller, so maybe just copy this figure. If you open this impeller, you see that it has that configuration on the inside. So that's on the on the front, and that part is coming from the bottom. Okay, we have remember we have fluid flowing in this direction. So this part opening is where the fluid comes in. So actually, this should be rotated. I'm not sure if you can rotate it here. I cannot rotate, but essentially it's the opposite way. It's um, is the fluid is coming through here and the fluid is coming through here then it's flowing through the packed passages and then it's coming out then you have a similar arrangement you have another of, the, of these ones you don't have just one this is what we call a stage okay a stage is is impeller also called rotor and diffuser. 
So remember, in the impeller, in a centrifugal pump or in any pump, we uh, in a rotor dynamic pump, we give energy to the fluid, we accelerate the fluid in the impeller, we accelerate in that passage the fluid moving at the velocity or the rotational velocity at which the motor rotates and then in the diffuser we recover that energy we convert all of that acceleration by expanding the channel okay remember the diffuser is like like that and it's simply recovering converting that energy from kinetic energy to to pressure okay to 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 potential energy so you have here the two parts that's the impeller and this one is the diffuser and they have to be made in such a way that the impeller so after here it goes enters into the next into this um, this slot here okay then it goes through the channel so this will be one this will be two this will be three the sequence and then it exits through here four it then enters into then enters into the diffuser on the back it has enters through here this is number five okay. then enters through here passes through the diffuser this goes inside and then goes to the next stage let's see if, if uh, I think I have a figure that shows that okay here where the fluid from the impeller so you see here enters through here then goes through the veins then comes out then out is collected by this is comes out is collected by the diffuser and the diffuser you have the diffusion effect and then it goes back and is inserted into the next impeller Okay, so you have to visualize a bit one here it comes through the rotor then comes out of the rotor then comes into the diffuser and the diffuser is taking it to the next to the next uh, to the next stage okay so if we have uh, several of them I think I have also one more figure here where we have a lot of stages we have a rotor diffuser rotor diffuser rotor diffuser how many stages as we want as we need to match that delta p if you have more stages we're going to see a bit later then you can reach a larger delta p but there is essentially a limitation on how many stages i can i can i can have because structurally physically i can have only a few i think the limit it is someplace in the hundred of stages um, <clears throat> then uh, one thing is is to I wanted also to mention is that the axis you have you see that you have in in the rotor I'm not sure if you can see it here but you have uh, opening okay, and that's for a key mechanism that you insert let, let me show you it will be clear if I show you that's taken from uh, Wikipedia So the axis which is rotating coming from the motor coming up is rotating the axis has also the same type of hole in in the in the okay, like the axis has the same type of hole and then you place a key in between which is joining the two together which is making that when the axis rotates on one direction then the impeller is also going to rotate on one direction and that has a limitation that when th so this um, is here is not shown but it's someplace should be here um, let's see fix so here you have the axis with this gray thing and then you have the impeller and then you have the key which is what holds these two together but this key only holds um, these two on the 
on the radial on the radial direction on the angular direction but not on the actual direction so the impeller is still free to move up and down and the amount of uh, we're not not um, we're going to go back to it but if we have a lot of fluid a lot of flow going through the impeller then this fluid is going to push this uh, the, the impeller up the the flow is going to push the impeller up and that push is going to you see here the diffuser is is actually going to contact you have here something called a washer and this washer is going to be in touch with the diffuser and then it's going to get eroded very quickly it's going to get worn very quickly because you have additional friction you have very strong push from the impeller up and then uh, you have uh, you have you're going to have early wear and the same thing can happen if the flow is not enough. If the flow is not enough, then the impeller is going to be laying and just touching this lower washer. And because of that, uh, then you're going to have again a lot of friction, a lot of heat, and also you're going to have uh, early wear, and you're going to have uh, to replace the equipment. So therefore, in this, which are called floating impellers, this configuration, you have to be careful with the amount of flow that you're flowing through the machine it has to be within some range it cannot be too high because otherwise the impeller will touch the upper uh, the, the the upper washer and then cannot be too low because then it will make too much pressure on the lower washer and these washers i'm not showing them here but essentially they are located one against this part that's the back yeah. and one this ring that you see here, there is a washer that goes there, and that's essentially this one. Let me also show... So that's... that's um, we're going to go to that just now. And then we have one that's not an electric submersible pump for oil and gas, but that's an electric submersible pump for 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 water wells but you see how it is the whole thing you have the motor where you have the cable entering through the motor you have here you don't have the seal section but that's something we have the protector in the ESPs here you have a suction strainer a filter to avoid material solids coming into the pump and then you have the series with all the stages in this case one two three four five six seven in our case, we have usually much more. And then you have the rest of the tubing on the top. Very nice figure, but a photo, but this, this is for a water, for water well. <clears throat> so the pump is, uh, the next, um, the pump is, is, uh, is um, you can regulate the pump you don't usually rotate it at a fixed frequency but you rotate it at different rotational speeds and that you do by controlling the frequency of the current coming into the motor what we have discussed We have the cable, the penetrator through the through the through the tubing hanger. Then we have this junction box where, if we have any vapors coming out of on the cable sheet inside the cable sheet, we uh, uh, this is supposed to avoid overpressure of that uh, cable. And then we have uh, the cable going to the switchboard. So. So we have the following distribution. So that's the switchboard. We have the junction box, and we have the current. Either we the electricity, we either take it from the grid, or we take it from a generator. We have a transformer that changes to the voltage that the pump is using. The typically it's um, 380 volts, and then we have the variable speed drive that is essentially changing the frequency of that input. We change the frequency to control the frequency of the pump and usually that frequency is typically between 30 and 70 Hertz 
bump bump frequency. Let's see what else. I think it has a few more images. If you see the just has a comment, the impeller when uh, when you have uh, some impeller that is more gas tolerant, it will be like that. You see here the fluid goes into the center and then it goes almost radial or goes radial. And then you have this configuration in which the flow goes like mixed, uh, is uh, like a semi-actual machine. Okay, the flow it goes not exactly radial, but it goes semi semi-actual. So that configuration is much better to avoid gas separation. Here you have a, a very a very abrupt change in direction and that promotes separation. You might have gas occupying part of the vein, which is not good. But in this one, you have that uh, it goes, uh, it follows, it's like a much smooth change of direction. It takes in a longer, longer time or longer uh, path to have that change in direction. Okay, so let's uh, copy that. Copy that here. Okay, so that's a more tolerant gas impeller. Gas impeller and diffuser. More tolerant to gas. If you have some amount of gas, it can be, I think, in the, the normal. Now the limits on ESPs are something around 40% GBF, then that's the type of impeller that you need to use. But you see then you can have much less stages because now you see how much space does it occupy compared to, compared to a radial stage because you need to have that smooth transition. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the operational map of ESP. Now you know how it looks like, what it has inside, what are the components of an ESP, but let's see what are operational map of ESP. An ESP has the map you have on the x-axis what we typically plot is the Q at the inlet is a, the total rate or the total volume rate can be a liquid in this in our case um, and, and water, so this will be typically Q oil plus Q water at the inlet conditions. And here we have the delta P. We are going to see just now the delta P is not what's plotted, but you plot um, uh, something called head. So the curve looks very much, if you ever forget to how to make it, it's, it's very similar to an IPR. It's something like that. Okay, where if you can see somehow in conservation of energy, you can decide if to have a very high rate, very very high rate is going through the machine, but then the delta P that you can create, it's it's um, is very low. The delta P, the increase in pressure you can provide to that fluid is low. But the opposite also is true that if you use a very low rate then the delta P that the fluid that the pump can give to the fluid is much bigger. So it's like a conservation of energy of the, of the pump. You have limited power and then you can use that power either to, um, to give you high flow rate and low delta P or you can use it to give you a low rate but a very high delta P. And that plot is for a given frequency. For frequency S, F. Okay, let's call it F1. Now, here is that issue with the uh, with the limit on the washer. Okay, what I told you about the up thrust. This is called what I explained you earlier is called up thrust and down thrust. Okay, up thrust. Okay and down thrust. Okay, down thrust, up, th up thrust is when your the flow rate is too high, then you are this this is touching and causing too much wear here. Maybe just make an arrow. And the down thrust is if 
uh, you have the opposite. You have too few rate and too low rate, and then the the impeller is touching, is laying down on on the on the lower washer, and it's causing excessive excessive shear. So that's one thing. You have that limit on the Q max and Q min, and that limit typically looks like simply two points. Let's make for now just two points. Okay, Q min, Q max, and Q min. You have a limit of two rates within which you have to operate. If you go above that, one thing that can happen, if Q is above Q max, then up thrust, but also low efficiency. If you make the efficiency plot also of the pump, hydraulic efficiency, versus Q inlet, it, is, it actually has a chart something like that. Where you have an optimum point, let's say here it's here, that's the best efficiency point. Okay, best efficiency point. And then if you go to the right, then you are going to reduce the efficiency. And if you go to the left, you're going to reduce the efficiency. And when you go above that Q max, that means that essentially the efficiency start to be very, very low. That efficiency, if you are wondering what it is, so essentially the power of the pump, hydraulic power, pump power, pump hydraulic power, is the delta P times the Q, let's say the inlet, okay, divided by hydraulic efficiency. So, that, and that's what I told you earlier, that that line essentially tells you in a bit the power, a bit the power. Okay, you can have either, if you have limited power, let's say you have a motor installed of some, some amount of uh, horsepower, then you can distribute that constant amount either with a big delta P, but then the Q has to be small, or you can distribute it with a low delta P, and then the Q can be very big on that region. And the hydraulic efficiency is simply a multiplier that tells you not only that multiplication, not all the power that the motor has goes to uh, this two terms, but also one part goes to hydraulic losses, to recirculations, areas of recirculations we have in the rotor, to friction with the rotor, friction with the impeller, uh, with the um, diffuser, etc. So just to show you what is some of the part of the reason of that hydraulic efficiency, of that uh, change in hydraulic efficiency. These are measurements that were made in a radial flow stage and you see here the passage of the rotor and you see at, at normal conditions a best efficiency point, best efficiency point. You see that the flow rate follows exactly the contour given between the veins. You have here some recirculation but essentially all the flow goes through the vein. Now when you start to increase, when you go to the right of the to the left in this case of the best efficiency point. Okay, and you see here you have the head and you have the efficiency, which is I, like we are moving to the left. When you start to use less rate, then what happens is that the fluid, here you have some fluid that is flowing against the impeller on an angle, with certain angle. That angle, it comes given by the amount of flow that I have. If I have less flow, now the, it, it, the flow will start to impact in a different angle the, the veins. And then you start having this recirculation, re recirculation region where you have a lot of energy losses. Here it will be more like that and here it will be even more like that. So a big part of the PACS passage is simply you have a lot of recirculation, a lot of vortexes, a lot of eddy, um, eddies that, uh, that they cause and they burn a lot of, a lot of power, a lot of uh, energy. And the same thing happens if you were increasing the rate, then you see the same phenomena, but on the other direction, because the flow now starts to go on the other direction. 
So that's the main, the reason, one of the reasons why to have these two limits is simply uh, uh, the up thrust and down thrust. Okay. This is also down thrust. but also because the limits of efficiency that if you go too low then you have too poor efficiency almost all the energy that you are using is simply used to uh, to burn is going to be burned in, in this uh, type of, of uh, configuration now what happens we don't have just one line then it will be very difficult right when we um, if we had just one line okay so far we said our curve of the pump looks something like that Q inlet and then we have Delta P and then we know that for a given rate um, let's say let's remember our well that we had we had our ESP and then we had our separator and let's say calculating the curve of IPR P Q oil and then we have this curve right? and we want to produce this rate Q star let's say for now at least as a consideration that the rate is the fluid is incompressible we have simply the rate local rate is equal to um, to the to the standard condition rate which we know is not equal but let's you do you that approximation just now so if you have depletion right let's say depletion now the IPR will be like that you see that initially let's say we were designing our pump for this Q and Delta P and we want to design for the best efficiency point so we say this Q I should obtain this Delta P exactly what I have here Q star I want to have that Delta P star and that's fine but now when I have depletion I want to maintain the same rate but you see that that's not something I can achieve in this um, in this pump it, with this simple line with this simple line now I have if I want to because I want to produce the same rate I should produce a different Delta P so that pump won't be able to produce won't be able to produce if I put that pump in the system it won't be able to produce what I need it will be able to produce a, a value which is much less and for that I have to use equilibrium which we are not going to discuss uh, we discuss here so something that is done what happens when we change the frequency of the pump And the same thing, Q inlet, and now we had just my line, this line, and then what happens when we change the frequency of the pump? When we increase the frequency of the pump, essentially the pump can deliver a higher delta P. It's like the curve is scaled up. So that's the frequency max, and then for frequency mean something like that I have the two lines of Q mean that's Q mean this one is Q max and I have typically have the best efficiency line this is B E L best efficiency line Okay, so essentially the area that the pump can operate it will be this region on the top is bounded by the maximum frequency the pump can rotate at so that's typically what I told you like 70 Hertz or 60 Hertz then we have the minimum is this line at which it can operate and that's typically 30 Hertz and then you have the Q mean and Q max, Q, sorry, Q max and Q mean, the opposite. That I have the reduced performance, the reduced 
um, efficiency, but also I have um, the down, the up trust. Sorry, no, it's the opposite. I did it correctly. This is Q max and Q min. And Q min. Sorry for that. They have the up trust and the efficiency will be reduced significantly and to the left they have the down trust or the efficiency will also be reduced significantly. So that's essentially the, the area of operation of the pump. And if you see, let's see how this way is essentially what I, this figure maybe we can copy that is in from the compendium. but. Um, We have here down trust and up trust, and uh, we have the different frequencies. Here um, is not so much as an IPR, but it has like a polynomial of order three. And then you have the minimum, maximum, and best efficiency line. Okay, and if you see from the catalog, this uh, curve is taken from a paper of uh, for the of the exercise we're going to work now in a while. Uh, you see here the uh, the different region, okay, where you have f min, f max, q max, and q min, the different areas, and these are different uh, models, okay, p47, ssd, p75, H, hc7800, and then you have the rate, and you have what this is called the head, okay, the head it's simply because the pump will this value or this curve will change like in the compressor. The compressor, you remember that the curve change depending on the 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 um, uh, molecular weight of the gas. It depended also on the inlet temperature. It depended also on the inlets. Uh, you had to do some corrections to the curve. So to avoid doing those corrections, the pump performance is typically expressed in terms of H, delta H, and that delta H is called head, and is a function of, is simply delta P divided by the density of the mixture, of the fluid. And simply that allows you, so you make the plot, it looks exactly the same, but now it's scaled, delta H is scaled with so let's say it looks like that, Q, and it's a scale with density. But the curve will be exactly the same if you have a fluid, let's say you have purely water or you have purely oil, the curve will look exactly the same, uh, this curve with head. Okay? The delta P won't look the same because the density is different, but this one looks the same. <clears throat> one more thing is that um, the viscosity of the fluid also affects the performance of the pump. So you saw before the density affects the performance of the pump, but essentially we know how to handle it. We know that the underlying curve delta H remains constant. The only thing is that to calculate the delta P, I have to multiply it times the density, which is quite, quite good. But now the viscosity also affects the performance of the pump. And if we look at, for example, delta H of the pump versus Q, we will see that for a given viscosity, let's say this is water, one centipoise, and then we use oil, then the curve will look something like that. For example, 10 centipoise for oil. Okay, so it will be reduced, um, it will reduce the operational map of the pump. It will be able to reach less delta H or less delta P for the same rate. Because simply you have, when you have viscosity, remember you have a lot of rotating parts, you have a lot of surfaces that rotate, that create friction, so that causes a lot of energy loss. So we're now going to make, after this is, um, 
uh, explain, we're going to make an exercise in which uh, we are going to... So essentially those, those are the things we have to look for. We have to look for the point should fall in the map and this map will change depending on the density of the fluid. It will change depending on the viscosity of the fluid. And uh, also the power constraint and the suction pressure should be above the bubble point pressure. So the way we model, so the pump usually comes from a catalog and it comes a bit like, like that. Okay, but for a given frequency, for a given frequency, typically I have what I use most software that you use for, for pumps use the following is a polynomial, uh, which order it depends, but you have a q to the fourth in case plus b q to the three plus c q to the two plus plus e for example a fourth order polynomial okay so you fit that equation to uh, you fit the collection of points that you have to a curve and essentially it's it's uh, it's uh, uh, it can be a fifth, fourth, third, or second degree polynomial, depending what fits better your, your shape. Like the shape I mentioned here, you won't be able to get that shape with uh, second order, so you have to use third or fourth. There are some other pumps that have a uh, more difficult curve. I think we are using a fifth or fourth order polynomial. So then to change uh, delta H as a new condition, at a new frequency f at f we if we make we say the ratio of delta h with delta h at a frequency one and two okay will be the same as saying frequency one divided by frequency two squared so we say the new point that i have let's say i have on my delta h q i have a series of point one two three four points. So this new point that I have, it should scale up by using the following relationship when I increase the frequency. All of these were for frequency one. And then if I have for frequency two, then I have to multiply this point, the delta H, by this, this, um, this ratio the ratio of f1 divided by f2. And also the same thing with the rate, q1 divided by q2 should be in this case proportional to f1, f2. So that point of performance that I have on my curve will translate to another point in which the q, the new q, this is q1, yeah, this is delta h1 and delta h2. The new point will be scaled up with the frequency, simply the q2 will be f2 times q1 divided by f1, and the new delta h at f2 will be a delta h at f1 multiplied by f2 squared divided by f1 squared. And that's called a similarity law. What essentially you say is that the correction I have to make is proportional with the rotational speed. And if you want to make that into a, um, if you want to make that, program that in the equation, and that's essentially what we do in the Excel sheet, we say delta H at a given frequency F will be A times, and here I have to say F, um, this curve was made for the reference rate, right? So I have to say the new Q time F reference divided by F to the fourth plus B f reference divided by f to the 3 q i'm missing q 
plus c f reference f squared plus d and the q f reference f q plus e because I'm I'm converting I'm converting first that equation that I have here is for all of these points were fit for the reference for a given reference uh, for a given reference frequency if you see here on that plot this uh, well it doesn't say but typically it's made either 50 or 60 Hertz depending where you are in the world so these coefficients were calculated for that 50 and 60 Hertz therefore if I want to use another rate for a, for another frequency for another other conditions then I have to I will say Q reference divided by Q is F reference divided by F simply then I have to clear this Q reference that's what the equation employs therefore is Q times F reference divided by F and then also the delta H this is the delta H of the reference to find the delta H of the real delta H then I have to multiply it times F squared divided by F reference squared And that's how you scale uh, the the, um, the this equation made for a single speed rotational frequency. Then that's how I scale it for any rotational frequency. We have a similar behavior for um, for efficiency, but we are not going to discuss it here.